Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. There's always that awkward moment where you say, is it going to work? Is it going to work? Oh, sorry. I did it and then I stopped. So thanks so much. And you know what? I'm going to bring you people in to organize my next conference because I have to say this is one of the best organized conferences I've ever been to, um, particularly virtually. I love how you have your little symbol up on your slide for the name of your conference so everybody knows who the organizers are. I loved the map at the beginning. That was spectacular. And a virtual dinner, that is outstanding. You guys have just done an amazing, amazing job. I've learned so much already and I haven't even started talking. Um, I particularly uh, want to start with respect to introducing this topic. I heard the word interdisciplinary at the beginning, and I want to talk a little bit about that before I begin. Um, because that shapes who I am and what I do and why I do the kind of work that I do. Um, and I want to introduce myself at the beginning because I think that's a really important part of understanding uh, research is understanding the researcher and how they think and, and what they think. In qualitative research, we call that reflexivity, but it's something that I've always done um, when I give uh, research talks to audiences who may not be familiar with me or my work. So I want to talk about plumbing poverty to plumbing violence, water security, and gender-based violence in the global south. And I think the interdisciplinary piece and the who I am piece are really important here because I recall being at a meeting uh, not that long ago and there was a basic scientist there. She was a chemist who worked on, on water quality. And she said, so what do you do? And I said, well, I do water security and gender-based violence. And she said, oh, so you have two different streams of research. You work on water security and you work on gender-based violence. And I said, no, I work on water security and gender-based violence and how they intersect. And that was absolutely anathema to her. From an interdisciplinary perspective, of course, this is very interdisciplinary work, but I prefer the word transdisciplinary. And I prefer that word, I'm actually, Google it, I, I wrote a paper about uh, multi versus inter versus transdisciplinarity in water research. Because when you get to the transdisciplinary piece, not only do are we asking different sorts of questions, we're also involving people who are affected by the things that you're, you're learning. We're involving the knowledge users in that. Um, so I'll, I'll return to those concepts as we go through, but just a little bit about me and then a little bit about water and health and then a little bit about plumbing poverty, a little bit about plumbing violence and then um, you can see where I am in this research. Um, and these are relatively new concepts, these concepts of plumbing poverty and plumbing violence. So I'm a medical geographer, as I was introduced. A lot of people don't know what medical geography is. I will say my very first job was at the University of Victoria. My very first job straight out of my PhD in the geography department. Woohoo! Very soft spot in my heart for the University of Victoria. Uh, and I was hired as a medical geographer. Um, to study the distribution, diffusion, determinants, and delivery of health and healthcare. And that's what medical geography is. And yet we look a lot of, at space, but I do uh, health research related to the environment. Um, so before we move on, we have to think about well, what does health mean? And I'm really big on you know being really clear about what people mean when they say words. And you'll see that as we move through the talk. Um, so health originally the absence of disease and then in 1958 the World Health Organization said it's more than simply the absence of disease it's complete physical social and emotional well being. That becomes a real challenge it's very comprehensive but how do you measure those things, how do you measure complete emotional well being. Could you say right now you have complete emotional well being probably not because you're a little bit stressed you're running a conference or you're listening to a talk. Um, or something else is going on in your life, or you might be physically unwell, or you might just be really worried about COVID and all the other things that are happening in the world. In 1986, the G8 health ministers met in Canada in Ottawa, and at the time, the Minister of Health uh, in Canada was a guy named Jake App, and they wrote a document called uh, Health for All, uh, and it's referred to as the Ottawa Charter for Health Promotion. And in that document, they described health as a resource for everyday living that allows us to manage, cope with, and even change our environment. And I really like that definition because it's much more active and it gives me agency over my health. 
health isn't something that just happens to me. It's something over which I have some control and I have some agency. And then there's the environment. And I like Einstein's definition of environment, which is everything that's not me. It includes the social environment, the physical environment, the political environment, the economic environment, and the cultural environment. So all of these environments. I'm smiling a little bit because I shared early on that it's noon where I am, and we just finished a comprehensive exam for one of my PhD students who passed very well, so you don't have to worry about him. Um, but one of the questions in his comprehensive exam was in socioecological theory, what do we mean by ecology? Where is the environment? What do we mean when we say environment? Uh, so words are really important. This is what I mean when I say the environment. So my own research areas are, are threefold. There's the built environment. So how do we construct the cities in which we live? And so, you know, we've done some work on walkability indices, right? So walkability indices are made up, or at least in our work, made up of three variables. How well connected are the streets in this uh, very uh, simple GIS map, geographic information systems map, um, the red nodes are real nodes. That means streets are crossing. That means it's easy to walk because you can cross the street and continue on. The green nodes are called dangle nodes. And that's what we see when we see, you know, the suburbs built in the 1960s and 70s where we have all kinds of cul-de-sacs. There's streets to nowhere, so people don't walk. The other thing that affects whether or not people walk in a neighborhood or in a city is the residential density. If you've got people living close together, they walk because they go to each other's homes. If they live far apart in a rural area, they don't. They have to use another mode of transportation like uh, a car. And then the other is land use mix. And so when we see kind of land use mix that's all the same, like all residential, people don't walk as often. But if you live in a mixed use neighborhood where there's shops, where there's cafes, where there's restaurants and other amenities, parks, um, people are more likely to walk. Put these three things together and you create a walkability index. And guess what? There is a direct one-to-one -one relationship between how walkable your community is or your neighborhood is and your body mass index. That is one of the major risk factors for chronic disease like cardiovascular disease and stroke. So how we construct our cities affects our health and we should think about how we build these cities. My second research area is around the socially constructed environment, right? It's the social environment and particularly how we socially construct environmental risk. And so I do a lot of work around food allergy. And I like to use this example because a lot of it, it resonates with a lot of students. You know, you can run to the grocery store uh, where you guys are in the West. You have uh, Safeway mostly, I think. Um, in my part of the world, we have uh, Metro, but everybody has President's Choice somewhere. And basically it's, you know, you run in at the end of the day because you're hungry and there's not much to eat at home. And if you do consume, um, meat, you run in and you buy one of these rotisserie chickens because you can do a lot with them. Um, and the ingredients, if you, if you can't see, it's pretty small. <coughs> Pardon me. The ingredients are chicken, salt, and water. But then there will be a statement underneath there that says may contain or may have come in contact with nuts or peanuts. And now if you have someone in your home who has a food allergy, now you've actually created some angst in that person. Should I buy it? Should I not buy it? Did it really come in contact with peanuts? Or are they just saying that because they want to cover themselves legally and so on and so on. So these sorts of may contain statements, which are called precautionary statements, they are voluntary on every food product. The ingredients lists are regulated under Canadian law. You have to put in all the ingredients. The may contain or the precautionary labels, purely voluntary. Um, but you might purchase a product that was made in a company where there are potential cross contaminations. And so they put these statements on here and it really worries people. And it particularly worries people who don't have food allergies who might be hosting people in their home who have food allergies. So you're creating risk by putting these voluntary statements on these products. And then I always say when things leak into popular culture, um, you know, it's a, it's a big issue, right? And so these are, uh, popular situation comedy shows on TV where people use food allergies to get out of social situations, where food allergies are used to bully other children. Um, and this was a big bullying issue in the movie Peter Rabbit, um, where there were food allergy scenes that sparked backlash from uh, parents of food allergic children and the movie was boycotted. Just some other 
um, examples in the social media where you can um, go and look at this. But what's really interesting, and if you if you look at the recording afterwards, this is just a paper that we did, which documents the prevalence of food allergy in Canada. And so normally when I'm in an in-person audience and I say, so what percentage of the Canadian population do you think has a food allergy? The answers I get are usually like 30%, 40%, 50%, way up even to 75%. And I say, that's really interesting because the prevalence of food allergy in Canada is 7.5%. 7.5%. And we actually documented that from a national sample. And then we went back five years later, did it again, because you know kids are diagnosed with food allergy two, three years old, uh, maybe four. And so five years later, we would have captured another whole cohort uh, to see if food allergies were increasing. And in fact, they are not, they're quite stable. And so where does this perception come from about this very high prevalence of food allergy? It comes from social media, it comes from popular culture, it comes from those labels on those products creating environmental risk for you, right? So it's the social construction of that risk. My final research area is the physical environment. And I look at things like climate change, water sanitation and health. And that's really uh, a primary piece of what I do, although I still do a lot of work on, on uh, social construction of environmental risk and chronic disease. So I work in North America, Central and Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, but mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And what's really fascinating is that um, uh, this is a piece that I wrote for the Canadian Journal of Public Health relatively recently, um, because the World Health Organization in October 2021 approved a vaccine for malaria. Malaria kills many, many more people in the world, particularly young children, than any other illness, more than HIV AIDS, more than COVID, more than monkeypox. And this amazing discovery got no media attention whatsoever. Nobody heard about it. It wasn't played up in the press. And it's because of the power relations that we see across the globe. I like to remind um, students when I'm talking about water issues, and we'll see this in a few minutes, that these water issues don't just occur in other parts of the world. They also occur in our own country. We know 1% of the Canadian population does not have access to water and sanitation, and they're primarily our Indigenous um, uh, members of our community. So it doesn't just happen there. But until we start to see that all health is global health, we still focus on that part of the world. So this is the part of the world that I work in primarily. This is uh, Lake Victoria, which is the second largest freshwater body of water in the world, second only to Lake Superior in the Great Lakes. You can see that it's a very well used lake. This is just a great snapshot that shows you how well used the, the lake is. There's people fishing, there's a kid bathing, there will be mothers doing laundry, there will be mothers drawing water from this lake for use in cleaning and washing and often for consumption when there are no other sources of water available. The lake is heavily contaminated with organic waste, primarily from humans and from animals. These guys over here on the far left, they're what are called car washers. And what they do is, you know, when people want their car washed, they actually drive it into the lake and these guys stand in the lake all day and wash cars. So the lake is getting contaminated also from uh, the cars that are there from petrol and so on. And these guys stand in this lake all day and um, end up with chronic schistosomiasis, which is a water-based disease um, carried by a little snail. So they're chronically ill. It doesn't kill you, but it makes you feel really awful all the time. Of course, we know that we're dealing with a major global crisis in terms of water security, right? So we have uh, Recently, 2017, WHO and UNICEF, 844 million lacking basic drinking water and 1.6 billion without access to adequate sanitation, which is the other kind of characteristic of my research is I don't think we can talk about water unless we also talk about sanitation. They, they go hand in hand, so to speak. 
and access to water is shaped by power relations and we need theories to inform our work and our work is informed by feminist political ecologies of health and so um we also because we're geographers we know that space and place shape these gender and gender relations and resource access and that gender uh, water is a gendered resource and that's centered around centered around three main issues the first is that women and girls are primarily responsible for water collection right about two million hours a year women and men have unequal participation in water governance so despite the fact that it's women's responsibility to provide water for the family and for the household, they have little, if any, say in how that water is managed. And women and girls experience disproportionate stress uh, as a result of wash insecurity, that is lack of access to water and sanitation, because the men will get the water first, the animals will get the water, um, the women will come last. How does this impact our health? Well, interestingly, in 1972, there was the Bradley classification of diseases related to water. So we have waterborne diseases, um, and these are outbreaks that are related to water quality. Cholera is a quintessential example of this. Pathogens survive in the water, and humans generally need a fairly low dose um, to be impacted. Cholera is a very unpleasant way to die but it's also a very romantic way to die. So I love to use this example, Life in the Time, uh, Love in the Time of Cholera, this amazing book by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which is a very romantic book about a, a couple who fall madly in love, but they're not allowed to get married because her father objects to the wedding. So they marry, she marries another man, grows old, has children, husband dies. The man who was in love with her all that time never married. And at the end of their lives, they find themselves on a ship in, this, in the um, Panama Canal and there's cholera on the ship. So the ship is flying a yellow flag and they can't go into port until the yellow flag is lowered. And the yellow flag can't get lowered until the cholera is gone, which means everybody either gets better or they die. So they spend all this time sailing up and down the Panama Canal and he's happier than he's ever been in his whole entire life because he finally has the woman that he loves to himself. And if you look it up on IMDb, the scene from the movie made from the book is listed as one of the most romantic love scenes ever in any movie. But if you read The Ghost Map, which is the story of the cholera outbreak in inner city London in the mid 1800s, you will read about how horrible cholera is and what a terrible way it is to die. This is a trigger warning for water washed diseases, just because it's not very pleasant to look at. When there's not enough water, personal hygiene is compromised. And this is a very um, severe example. Uh, diarrhea or infections of the skin and eyes are a result, but this is a, an issue that my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Diana Caranja works on in Kenya, and it's called jiggers. It's a flea that burrows under the skin and particularly under the skin of children's feet as they're walking outside uh, with no shoes on. It's not fatal in 99% in of cases, it's not fatal, but it's quite disfiguring. And when children are affected that much, it's quite painful. She has an incredible research program to try and address this issue by providing safe water um, for washing, but also uh, a partnership program with a company called Tom Shoes, which provides uh, one pair of shoes for a child in need for every pair of shoes we in the in the developed world purchase. Um, but water wash diseases are diseases like these. And again, these are diseases that are, you know, cholera can kill you. Uh, you can get better from cholera if you're treated. Jiggers likely not going to kill you, but again, very disfiguring, very uncomfortable. Water-based diseases are diseases that are transmis transmitted sorry, through a host that lives in the water. Schistosomiasis is a great example. The guys I showed you earlier who stand in the water all day who are washing cars, um, this snail impacts them. And honestly, it's just one pill. You take one pill and you're better, but you don't develop any immunity. So if you continue in those activities, you're just chronically, chronically ill. And it has real, schistosomiasis has real gender-based impacts, which I did not know until I started working with colleagues in Kenya, because women who are standing in the water, who are doing laundry or other household activities, 
um, the snails can actually embed in their reproductive organs, causing uh, reproductive issues and in fact, causing them to become infertile. And there's water related diseases. These are you know, vector borne carried and transmitted by insects that breed in or near water like fever, oh sorry, dengue fever, malaria, and sleeping sickness, which affects a huge proportion of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and again, mortality rates are low, but the morbidity impacts are tremendous and the prevalence, the proportion of the populations are huge. If we look at the estimated burden of illness from unsafe water and sanitation, uh, Pruce Houston is uh, the key person there and she has done several studies over time. And the, these are the most recent data. 1.6 million deaths, 105 million daily adjusted life years. So for those who are not from the health world, a daily adjusted life year or a DALI as we like to call them is yes, you're alive, but your life is, uh, your, your health and your quality of life are impacted by some sort of health issue. So when we think about jiggers, it's, um, you know, if you're impacted, yes, you're still alive. You haven't lost, you haven't registered as a death, but the quality of your life and the health of your life is severely impacted. So that's a huge impact. 2.8% uh, of total deaths around the world, 4% of dallies around the world, um, and so on and so on. So huge impact on the global burden of health by issues related to water. So what do we do about it? Well, we had the MDGs and then the SDGs, right? So the MDGs were the eight goals uh, from 2000 to 2015. There was no water goal. Water was subsumed under the sustainability goal and it was a target. Um, we met that target for water in some countries, not others. Um, we came nowhere near to meeting the sanitation target. When the SDGs were established in 2015, we now have 17 targets, sorry, 17 goals and 169 targets, but we do now have SDG six, safe water and sanitation for all by 2030. That's eight years from now. So how are we doing? We're not doing so well. So the um, UN Water, which is the organization of every single UN organization that has anything to do with water. I think it's like 36 organizations. They came together in uh, 2020 and said, hey, <laughs> we're not gonna meet our goal. What are we gonna do about this? So they developed this acceleration report. Let's put the pedal to the metal, let's go faster. And what they're saying is to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all is alarmingly off track. At the current rate of progress, the world will not reach our targets. Rates of progress dating back to 2000 show we've achieved an average of 1% annual progress, but we need to be at 3%. So we need to triple our efforts to get to SDG six. And then what happens? A global pandemic is declared on March 11th, 2020. And how do we stem the spread? We get people to wash their hands. And how do you wash your hands when there's no water? So the gaps we identify in um, this larger research program of the global water crisis and the relationships between water security and health are first of all, gender. This is a gendered issue, but nobody's paying attention to that component. This plumbing poverty issue where we identify it, you know, there, there's this whole literature around energy poverty and we need to recognize that this is a global issue. Yes, it's primarily impacting countries in the global south, but it's a global issue and we have discovered that there is a component of this related to gender-based violence. And there's no research being done on this at all, um, or very, very little. Our, so our team is really concentrating on this area. Um, we know that it happens because of media reports and because of the stories that women tell other women, but there's no research done in this area. So from a gender perspective, 
This is a review of measures and indicators for gender in WASH put out by the Joint Monitoring Program, which is the program of the WHO that looks after access to water and sanitation and documents things. And this is from June 2021. So this is how recent this is. What they say is um, within the safety and freedom from violence dimension, seven themes were identified and a national level measure was identified for only two of those themes, both related to menstruation. So that aspect of women's health. Uh, perception of safety when engaging in various wash activities and safety features of the physical environment. So that's the only uh, context within which in this document about gender and wash that violence is mentioned. Um, where we say we tend to focus on safety while accessing wash facilities and locations and largely overlook violence related to wash responsibilities and norms or violence related to participation in wash committees, meetings and events. So literally violence related to women participating in the management of the water resource. From a plumbing uh, poverty perspective, this is a really, really interesting um, literature review that we, not by our team, and I'll show you the reference in a minute, it's on the next slide, but um, this is about plumbing poverty in the United States. So using US Census Bureau data, um, dependent variable is plumbing completeness. So do you have complete access to water and sanitation in your home? And then doing that by race, income, housing type and tenure. Uh, they did logistic regression analysis at the household level um, and then uh, spatial autocorrelation analysis using um, or hotspot analysis using a, a Getty's G. So hotspot analysis is, <coughs> pardon me, you put all the data on a map and you do, you run this analysis, you use Moran's eye or Getty's G. You don't need to know what those mean, but basically what they're doing is looking for hotspots. Where are the areas that are really bad that are happening together in a space. And then there are also cold spots. Where are the things where that's not happening? So we look for hot spots and then we target our resources to those hot spots. That's why those analyses are done. Um, and so what do we see from uh, this amazing analysis by Shiloh Dietz um, is that we see percentage of households. So this is descriptive statistics of household characteristics and incomplete plumbing percentage of households that are American Indian or Alaska Native, 1.5, percentage of those households with incomplete plumbing, 6.2. So you see a real inequitable ratio, right? Small proportion of households, but a very large proportion of those households with incomplete plumbing. Black, we have 13% of the households, but 17% without complete plumbing. Hispanic, 12 and a half, 16.7. Um, we see a large discrepancy, mobile home occupant, 6%, but 14% with incomplete plumbing. Um, and again, so when we think about a, a mobile home occupant, we think about people from a very low socioeconomic status. When we see renters, um, people who have less control um, and who are subject to a power relationship to a landlord, 36% and 51% with uh, incomplete plumbing. And this is in the United States of America. So what these data are showing is that plumbing, incom plumbing incompleteness is spatially clustered in certain regions of the country and clearly racialized. Um, in Canada, we know 1% of our population does not have access to adequate washed. And what happened in the US in March 2020 when the um, pandemic was declared, uh, 90 municipalities in the United States of America had to pass legislation to force uh, privatized water companies to turn the water back on um, in poor low-income households who were too poor to pay their water bill because they had to wash their hands. And, you know, it was 2010 when the UN declared that water was a human right. That's plumbing poverty. Plumbing violence is when you have, this is a story of a, a, I have a colleague who runs a maternal and child health program. And this is one of her clients who delivered her baby. She was 14 years old when she delivered the baby and she had gone to get water for her household and quite often there's a very long line. And so the young girls who are sent to get the water, they'll often go very early in the morning, three or four in the morning and it's still very dark. 
and they get raped, they'll often get pregnant. And in this case, this young woman didn't tell anybody what happened or that she was pregnant or perhaps she didn't understand. And so she, um, all of a sudden, you know, they realized that she was pregnant and she gave birth to the baby. So mom and, and baby were absolutely fine, but it was a result of getting raped while she was standing in line to get water. So when we look back on that Bradley classification of diseases, it was redone by um, the guy who used to run the joint monitoring program for the WHO. And they actually added in violence. Proposed clarifications and modifications to the original Black Bradley classification, they added in injury and violence associated with water collection. So at least it's there now. But um, a bit gender blind. I'm going to skip. Oh, no, I'm not going to skip this. I'm going to skip over the theoretical stuff. But um, when I talk about framing wash and gender based violence, these are <coughs> actual uh, figures taken from sites that I've visited in Ghana and in Kenya and Uganda, uh, where People are reminded, this is on the side of a school in Ghana, that uh, they're reminded that rape is a crime. Um, this is painted on the side of an elementary school or a primary school rather in Ghana, showing that it's wrong for adult men to take a girl uh, and rape her while she's trying to relieve herself. This is a school in Ghana that has beautiful uh, latrines put up by UNICEF. Um, and a wonderful water collection system put in by UNICEF. But when I spoke to the head uh, master there, he told me that oops, before that, uh, they had um, the girls would go out into the bush and there'd be adult men waiting in the bush uh, for them to take advantage of them during the school day. So how do we research water security and gender-based violence? We've had a bit of a challenge, but that challenge has turned into a great opportunity. Uh, we had a challenge because we wanted to research this and then COVID-19 hit, so we couldn't really go out into the field when and how we wanted to. So we started with a document review, we did some conceptual development, we did a scoping review, we've done some quantitative research, and we've done some qualitative research. The first was the uh, document review, and this is really tiny, but I'm just going to point out that, so this is that UN water strategy document here. And these are the categories that we looked for and coded for in these documents, water, sanitation, hygiene, women, girls, and wash, wash women and girls, and so on and so on, all the way down to gender-based violence, uh, women and girls. Sorry, I don't know what's doing that. Um, and you'll see that, yes, we dealt with uh, water, sanitation, and hygiene, but anything to do with gender, that document is completely gender blind. Um, UNICEF very little about gender except as it uh, uh, relates to menstruation, which is the one place that we see it. We see a lot in water sanitation and hygiene documents, the, strat the global strategy for that, but pretty much gender blind. So when we go to the policy documents that are supposed to be leading action, we see very little about gender and we see very little about gender-based violence. This is our theorizing of this. I'm gonna go over this very quickly. You can go back and look at the video. Um, and you can read about it in here because, you know, theory is important. So we theorized it. This is how we theorize it using feminist political ecology. So then we go to the literature and we do a scoping review. Okay, so now we know there's nothing in the policy documents. What's in the published literature? So this is the PRISMA. Uh, so those of you done scoping or systematic review will know what PRISMA is. Uh, so you start out with 10,712 articles. We ended up with 29 peer-reviewed articles that addressed water security and gender-based violence. When we review those, we came up with a taxonomy of violence, physical, sexual, psychosocial, and structural. Physical violence being assault by a spouse or a family member. So, you know, there, there are times when women will be physically assaulted by their husbands if they don't provide enough water for the household. Sexual violence, um, so, sexual assault, rape, peeping, um, for when girls are relieving themselves or um, going to collect water. And uh, often there are stories of transactional sex. Um, so women trading sex for water. 
um, psychosocial violence, shame, embarrassment, fear, stigma. So going off into the bush to relieve yourself and, and um, just feeling really embarrassed and shameful about that when you have no privacy. And then structural violence, political and economic marginalization vis-a-vis uh, -vis wash access. So for example, it's a woman's responsibility to provide water for the household, but she may not have access to any economic resources within the household. Um, so the structures uh, allow her no capacity to actually fulfill her um, culturally normative household responsibilities. And when we break that down, what we saw was about a third of the papers uh, reported physical violence, over a quarter reported sexual violence, almost 80% psychosocial violence, and 55% structural violence. And of course, there's some double counting there because of the there'd be more than one type of violence in a paper. So that's all the desk stuff, right? So then we go out into the field and because it was um, COVID, we actually used uh, locally trained researchers to collect the data for us and with us. We have about 2000 completed surveys from across Uganda, Kenya, and Ghana. Um, and we have some qualitative data just from Kenya. In terms of the surveys we administered, um, we focused particularly on populations made vulnerable by structural factors, so young uh, mothers without support and seniors. And we administered a wealth index, a water security index, uh, we gathered health status, both physical and psychosocial. We um, employed a gender empowerment and wash index, which was developed by my colleagues, Sarah Dickin and Elijah Bassoum. Um, we asked about experiences with COVID-19 and we asked about experiences with violence related to WASH, whether they had experienced it or they, their neighbors or their family members had experienced it. And the percent reporting having experienced violence with respect to WASH, whether it was water or sanitation, was 100%. 100%. That could have been structural violence, physical violence, sexual violence, or physical violence. When we did oral histories with it, so this is in-depth qualitative, right? So much smaller sample size, and we've only done it in Kenya so far because of impacts of COVID and getting it into the field. Um, so with 25 women who were over about 75 years old and asked them about their experiences with WASH over the life course. What was it like when you were a child, when you were a young woman, when you were in school, when you, um, were married when you had children and so on. Experience with violence in the context of WASH of these women, again, was 100%. Every single one of them reported violence. So we now have a research proposal um, going into IDRC called Women Rise. And it's based on the UN roadmap for recovery for building back. Um, and it was actually a Canadian, Steve Hoffman, who was seconded to the UN to write this document or contribute to this document. And it talks about quick wins, best buys and game changers. Um, and we have partnered with NGOs in Uganda and Kenya. And um, the way that we do research is we sit down with our partners and say, okay, tell us what, what have been the greatest impacts of COVID-19 on your communities? Because we know the prevalence of mortality and morbidity has not been what we originally anticipated it would be. What are the greatest impacts? Teenage pregnancy. Without hesitation, my partners in Uganda and Kenya said it's teenage pregnancy, why? Because during COVID there's been tremendous reverse migration from cities to rural areas. Young women are not in school, which is a safe place for them because the schools were closed because of COVID. And now they're surrounded by adult men who are taking advantage of them in many, many situations, but also in the situation of water, sanitation and hygiene. So what would we do about it? So in conclusion, this is my final slide and this is my tagline. We talked about the sustainable development goals. My conclusion is always three through six by five. Three is health and well-being for all by 2030. And we're not gonna have health and well-being for all by 2030 until we have water and sanitation for all, everyone in the world by 2030. And we're not gonna have either of those things until we empower women which is sustainable development goal five. Until we empower women, we're not gonna have water and sanitation for all, and then we're not gonna have health for all. And I'll finish there. Thank you.